respected elders and brothers, we have been discussing the journey of hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So now the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he is approaching Medina, and obviously, how many people are traveling on this journey? Three. So you got the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and. Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu an and who's the third one? And a guide. His name is? Abdullah bin Uraykid. So as they get closer to Medina, so they needed a guide because they were going to go round the shore side. They weren't going to take the main highway to Medina. So once they got close to Medina and they managed to recognize the way and Abu Bakr radiyallahu and he knew the way forward, then Abdullah bin Uraykid is now paid off and he leaves. So now you only got two, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. So as they are traveling, one man recognizes Abu Bakr radiallahu an. So Abu Bakr radiallahu was a rich businessman. He would travel to many places. So this man had done business with Abu Bakr radiallahu an. So he recognized him and he, was, he came up to greet him and he said, how are you? Nice to see you. And then when he spotted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam next to him, he said, who is this? Who is this man? So obviously, this is a secret journey. There's a warrant against them that anyone who brings live or dead, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there will be a reward of 100 camels. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu couldn't tell him that we are migrating to Medina and this is the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what does Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu say? What does he say? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says that this is my guide. So meaning, so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in his mind, he's saying this is my guide to Jannah. He's guiding me how I should worship Allah and get to Jannah. And the other man is going to understand he is his guide towards Medina. He's guiding him on the journey. Yeah? So it's like, it's in Arabic you call it Tawriya or Hila, where you use a word you take one meaning and the person you are speaking to understands a different meaning. Yeah? Even it's in the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, when his nation is going out to worship the idols and Ibrahim alayhi salam wants to smash all the idols up, they say, Ibrahim, you should come with us to worship the idols as well. And Ibrahim alayhi salam says, Inni saqim, that I am sick. So obviously, a prophet is not going to lie. So if he's not sick, what does he mean? He's spiritually sick. Every one of us, we are spiritually, we can do better. We are spiritually sick, and the others thought he was physically sick. So again, another form of tawriya. So in extreme circumstances, in order to save yourself, it would be permissible to use tawriya at certain times. And again, we'll find it in, in another incident of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So you know when Ibrahim alayhi salam was traveling with, with Sarah, and they were passing through Egypt. Then there was a tyrant king there. And the king, whenever he would find a husband and a wife traveling, then he would take the wife and he would abuse the wife. So Ibrahim alayhi salam was worried what's going to happen. That was his wife, Sarah. So when the king asked her, who is this lady? What did he say? My he said, she is my sister. Rather than saying that, and sister, what did he mean by sister? Sister in Islam, you know, like we are all brothers in Islam. We're not, one is blood brothers, but we're not blood brothers. Yeah, but Ibrahim alayhi salam, he, when he said sister, he meant we are, you know, sisters in faith. We share the same faith. So, Tawriya. So, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is my guide. So now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is about to arrive into Medina. So before we carry on, we should discuss uh, Medina itself and the virtues of Medina. Come on you guys, you should know some. What are the virtues of Medina? Why has the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about Medina? Medina Munawwara. Good, that's the name. Okay, let's talk about the name first. So Medina Munawwara means the enlightened city. So that's one of the names of Medina. And then the proper name of Medina is? No, that's an old name. Even today, what's the proper name? When you enter Medina, what does it say on the board? It says, Medina to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So that's the Prophet, with the full name is actually Madinah the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And previously it was called Yathrib. So if someone was to call Madinah Yathrib today, is that correct or incorrect? Connor? Incorrect. Why? It's the old name. It's the old name, so, so what? Yeah, good. Anyone else? So there's actually a hadith, and it's a hadith in Muslim where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, anyone who calls Medina Yathrib, then he should seek the forgiveness of Allah. So that that means it's a prohibition that we should not call that city Yathrib anymore. We should call it the name given to by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So one reason is that the Prophet named it Al Medina. So why should we use the previous name? And another reason is Yathrib. What does Yathrib actually mean? Disease or? It could mean disease as well. And you know, it's in Surah Yusuf. La tathrib. La tathrib alaykum al yawm. It means criticism. Yeah, to criticize. So it's, it's not a good name. So it, it was the habit of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam whenever someone or something would have a name with a bad meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would change it. So there were many times many people came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said what's your name and he mentioned a name and the Prophet said the meaning was, didn't mean good. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam changed it. So you know, if someone's called sour yeah, it's, it doesn't really have a good meaning. So the Prophet would make, to change it to mean something more pleasant. So that's why we shouldn't say Yathrib, we should say Medina, Medina Munawwara or Medina Dur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Other names are Tayba and Taba. In fact, in that hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever calls Medina Yathrib, he should seek forgiveness because now it is Tayba, it is now purified. Okay, the virtues of Medina. Yes. It's a piece of Jannah where? The Rawda, good. So you got the the original mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that ma bayna mimbari wa bayti Rawda tum min riyadh al Jannah. The what is between the house and the mimbar is a portion of Jannah. We'll talk about that next week when you actually get to the building of the masjid itself. But there's another portion of Jannah in Medina as well. Why, why is that? There's a mountain. What's the mountain in Medina called? Uhud. The mountain of Uhud. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hada jabalun yuhibbuna wa nuhibbuhu. That this is a mountain, it loves us. The mountain loves the Muslims. And we also love this mountain. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that this mountain of Uhud will be in Jannah as well. So again, it's a blessed land that even the mountain of Medina, we're going to find it in Jannah as well. And you any other virtues of Medina? <laughs> yes, mashallah. So one of the virtues is that the Dajjal will not be able to enter Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the greatest test, the greatest fitna that is going to come upon this nation is the fitna of Dajjal. And every single Prophet who came before, he warned his people of Dajjal. It wasn't only the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, every single Prophet, they warned the people that beware, that this is such a great trial that every single Prophet warned its people of the Jal. But if you want to save yourself from the Jal, one easy solution is you go into the city of Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that there will be seven different entrances into Medina. And on every single entrance, there will be two extremely large, huge angels and they will repel the Dajjal away. So the Dajjal will not be able to enter Medina. There's another hadith, the Prophet wasallam says that Iman returns back to Medina. So what that means is, you know when you have an animal, an animal comes out of his hole and when the animal faces danger, when someone's trying to hit the animal, what does it do? What does it do? It, it runs back into its hole. So as Muslims, when our Iman is in danger, the safest place for us to go will, will return back to Medina. Is that Medina itself is a place which is uh, protected, purified, and the Dajjal will not be able to enter it. Any other virtues of Medina? Good. 
So before we die, we, let's talk about living. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that Medina is a blessed place to live. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made dua for Medina. Allah, he made dua for Barakah. We all know Barakah in it. That gave us blessings. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua, Allahumma barik lana fi Madinatina wa fi sa'ina wa fi muddina. That Allah grant us Barakah in our city. And obviously, if we go there today, we feel the sense of Barakah in everything. And those people doing business there also feel the uh, barakah in business as well. So you know when the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, when they migrated to Medina, it wasn't easy. It wasn't that you just moved there, like, like staying in a five-star hotel. It wasn't like that. When they moved to Medina, the, the climate is different in Medina to Makkah. You, got, you know those guys who've been there, Makkah is really hot day and night. Medina at night it actually gets quite cold. So the climate is different. People began to get sick. And they were more homesick as well. They missed the Kaaba, they missed Makkah, they missed the land they grew up in. So one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Abu Bakr radiallahu an and Bilal radiallahu an. They are sitting on the outskirts of Medina and they are looking in the direction of Makkah. And they are crying and they are feeling, they are feeling really upset. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked what's wrong. So they said we are missing, we are homesick, we are missing Makkah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made a dua that Allahumma habbib ilayna al-madinata ka hubbina Makkah aw ashad or Allah grant us the love for Medina just as much we used to love Makkah and even more aw ashad grant us even more love for Medina So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for Makkah sorry for Medina and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said anyone who lives in Medina is a, a blessed place to live but only if the people knew And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says If someone is leaving Medina Thinking that Medina is not good enough for him he thinks, he thinks it's not a good place Then don't worry, let him leave Allah will replace him with a better person I mean, If you think that uh, Medina is not good enough for me Then it's not, the Medina is not good You are not good enough for Medina Allah will bring there someone else to reside in Medina So the people of Medina Are special people Are people who uh, are living in the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And then just as it's blessed to live in Medina It is just as blessed to die in Medina as well To die in Medina is blessed The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam There's a hadith in Muslim the Ahmad The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says That if you can try and die in Medina Why? Because I will intercede for all those people Who die in Medina So to die in Medina is also great, it's a great virtue. In fact, you know Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, he used to make a dua. What's, what was the dua he used to make? He would say, Allahumma inna nas'aluka shahadatan fi sabilik, wa fi baladi habibik. So he would say, that, oh Allah, let me die as a shaheed, let me be martyred in your path. But also let me die in the city of your beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his own son would say, Father, what are you on about? How is that possible? That you're going to die in the path of Allah, you're going to die as a shaheed, you're not going to die in Medina, path of Allah, you're, you're going in a battle, you're not going to fight in a city, you're going to go out. And then you want to die in a city as well, and in, it doesn't make sense, your dua. But nevertheless, Umar radiallahu anh, he continued making this dua, and his dua was accepted. So Umar radiallahu anh, he was martyred in the Masjid al-Nabawi, in the Mihrab, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam leading the Fajr Salah when he was stabbed. He was, so he was died, he died in the city of and he was a martyr as well. So Allah accepted this dua which people were thinking it's a strange dua. How can this become true? But Allah accepted it. That Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi he stabbed Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an in the Fajr Salah. So to die in Medina is also blessed. And what's the graveyard called in Medina? Come on, what's the graveyard called in Medina? Jannatul Baqi. So we, in our culture, we call it Jannatul Baqi. So you know, those of you who went for Umrah, what did the signboard say? He didn't say Jannatul Baqi. You guys weren't looking. So it says Baqi al gharqat That's the official name in the hadith as well, is Baqi al gharqat And on the signboards, it says Baqi al gharqat So that's the official name of the graveyard. So that graveyard is a blessed graveyard. You know, even Hajar, Rahmatullah, he mentions that 10,000 Sahaba are buried there. 
Imagine 10,000 Sahaba buried in Baghi and we also have the possibility we could be buried there as well. So normal people like us are also buried there today. And the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are buried there. So the Prophet's 11 wives, nine of them died in Medina and nine of them are buried. Aisha radiallahu anha, Umm Salma, all of these wives are buried there. Obviously Khadija passed away in Mecca, but the rest of them passed away in Medina. Who, from the Khulafa or Rashidin, who's buried in Baqi? From the four Khulafa, Abu Bakr and Umar, they're not buried, are they? Ali is a key. Ali is, I don't think Ali is buried there either, radiallahu So, Uthman, so Abu Bakr and Umar, radiallahu anhuma, they are buried next to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in that same room. And Uthman, radiallahu anhu, is also buried in Baqi. You got the son of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ibrahim. Ibrahim, when he passed away, he was buried in Baqi as well. Then you got uh, the daughters of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi all four of them. Zainab, Ruqayya, Umm Kulthum, and Fatima, radiallahu anhun, all of them are buried in Baqi. So you got these you know, great personalities who are all buried in Baqi, and we could be buried there as well. And then you got the Fuqaha. So Imam Malik, rahmatullahi alayhi, he's buried in Baqi as well. And then you got Imam Nafi'ah, he's buried in Baqi as well. And then from our modern scholars as well, you got many of them who are buried there. The most famous of whom would be uh, Shaykh al Hadith, Mawlana Muhammad Zakariya, rahmatullahi alayhi, he also is buried in Baqi. And there's lots of scholars, for, even from today, you know, it just happens they die in Baqi. And that's a blessed graveyard. The Prophet says that on the day of Qiyamah, the first person to rise from the grave will be me. And rising with me will be. Who's going to rise with him? Before, before that. Abu Bakr and Umar. Radiallahi. The Prophet is going to rise up from his grave. Abu Bakr and Umar are going to be either side. And the three of them are going to walk to Baqi. Then all the people of Baqi who have been buried there, they will rise. And they will walk with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Makkah. Then the graveyard there. So imagine how lucky those people buried in Baqi are. So, uh, so that's another virtue of Medina. So the Baqi, Baqi al harqat a very blessed place to die, so we should also not be, we shouldn't be afraid to make dua like Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, oh Allah, give us uh, the death in Medina Munawwara as well. And I was saying, Amen. Amen. So, uh, virtues of Medina. So another virtue of Medina, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, says that whenever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be returning from a journey, and he would see the signs of Medina, he would see the city of Medina, then he would get really excited. And he would hasten his uh, uh, horse or camel, and he would be really happy to get into Medina. I mean, that was the love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had for Medina. Another virtue of Medina is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that no plague can affect Medina. You know what a plague is, yeah? So a plague, ta'un, say in Arabic, ta'un, a plague can never afflict Medina. So in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab, there was actually a great plague, but the people of Medina were not affected. And even if you look lately, you know, in the 19th century, you had the Spanish influenza. It was in, I think, 19, 1918 or something, was it? 1918. And then there was like mass populations were killed because of this flu. But again, Medina remains safe. Anyone got any objection on the hadith? COVID-19. Even COVID-19, COVID-19 comes as a waba. Ta'un is like a greater plague. And waba is a little bit of a lower level. And COVID was lower level. But even in Medina, we never heard that there's so many people dying in Medina. In other parts of the world, we, we saw mass graves. So, so many people have died, they've dug mass graves to bury all of the people together in one. We never heard that in Medina. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that a plague can never enter Medina. What's the reward for praying salah in Masjid al-Nabawi? How much reward do you get? Sorry? A thousand. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the hadith in Muslim, the Ahmad, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that whoever prays in the haram in Makkah, he will get 100,000 rewards for one salah. 
And those who pray in Medina, in the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they will get 1,000. And if you pray in Masjid Al-Aqsa, then you get 500 for one salah. So again, just to pray in Masjid Al-Nabawi is a blessed thing as well. So these are some of the virtues. I think there may be more if you study hadith properly. There's loads of virtues about Medina dul Munawwara. And then the question is, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala chose the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to migrate to Medina. Not any other city of the world. So what are the benefits that we can deduce from, you know, from hindsight, uh, reading on 1400 years later, what's the benefit of going to Medina and not nowhere else? Benefits of Medina? It's close to Makkah. It's close to Makkah. So what's the benefit of that? It would have been easier for them when they had been there, but it was in conquest of Makkah. MashaAllah. It's a really good answer. So Medina, it's not actually, it's far enough from the Quraysh that you're not going to be harassed by the Quraysh. It's far away. So you know, they're not going to harm you too much. But at the same time, it's close enough that when on the time of Fadi Makkah, if they want to come to do Umrah, they can still come within a few days' journey. Whereas if they move to Habasha or any other part of the world, they will be miles away. And to stay connected to the Kaaba would be much more difficult. So that's a really good answer. That Medina is actually cl is close and it's far. It's like a moderate distance. You are safe, but you still got the accessibility to the Kaaba as well. Mashallah. Anything else? What's the other benefits of Medina? Mashallah. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had relatives in Medina. Who was? How was Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam related in Medina? Which, does anyone remember? We done it right at the beginning of Sira. What tribe was he from in Medina? The Banu Najjar. Do you guys remember? The Banu Najjar. You know, Hashim. You guys, who's Hashim? Maruf, who's Hashim? Oh, come on, man. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is Muhammad bin Abdullah bin Abdul Muttalib bin... Hashim. Hashim is the great grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Hashim was married to a woman of Medina called Salama, and then uh, they went on a journey to Palestine, and ha and Hashim passes away. So Salama she goes back to Medina. She doesn't tell the Quraysh that she's pregnant, and then Hashim is born. So not Hashim, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is born in Medina. Do you guys remember this or not? He done it right at the beginning. So, so Abdul Muttalib, he's actually born in Medina. And then when he was 13, 14 years old, then one of the Qurashis came and he looked at him and he saw, oh, you look like a Qurashi. And then when they done research, they realized this is the son of Hashim. And then they took him back to Makkah to inherit the land again. So there's actually links, family links to the, by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Whose house is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam staying in Medina? Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. They are actually six cousins Going up six generations They are actually cousins with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So there's links, family links to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Any other benefits of Medina? Um, a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr Siddiq, from a Pharaoh, and then there was an empty shrine for Isa Alayhi Wasallam. Can you just tell us a brief? Uh, when Isa Alayhi Wasallam dies a natural death, he will be buried there. Brief. Why was he um, picked? Why Medina next to a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Uh, Isa Alayhi is going to fight the Jan with Imam Mahdi. It'd be interesting for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So we are talking about the benefits. Now, the reason, another reason of moving to Medina is logi logistically, Medina is naturally defended on three sides. On one side, you got on, on, you know on three sides. On some sides, you got the mountains, so no army can penetrate through the mountains. And on the other sides, you got dense date palms. So you know one person can get through the date palms, but you can't walk with you know with the army which got a lot of armor and everything, and the whole army can't walk through those dense forests of palm trees. So, in, like in the Battle of the Trenches, 
the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only needed to dig a trench on one side of Medina. On three sides, they're naturally defended already. That's another benefit of Medina. Okay, so now going forward, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrives into Medina. So arriving into Medina, which date does the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam arrives into Medina? Okay, which date did the Prophet leave, leave uh, Makkah? Date. On the 27th, on the 27th of Safar is when that meeting happened with, the, with, the, with Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And then three days they spent in the cave of, cave of Thawr. Do you remember? So now it's the first of Rabiul Awwal. So by the time they leave to go and come to Medina, so the journey from uh, Makkah to Medina a very fast person, the fastest you can do it is about three and a half days. That's a person who's alone, who's going on a really fast horse. Three and a half days is the minimum. But the normal amount is about seven days. And obviously the, now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's not taking the main road, the main route to Medina. He's taking the, the coast. So it's a longer way. And then they're stopping in a few places as well. They are hiding. So... We can estimate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam may have arrived into Medina on the 9th or the 10th of Rabiul Awwal. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrives in Medina on a Monday as well. So he arrives in uh, on a Monday and Medina has different localities. You know, like in Chomsud, you've got different localities. You've got Gallywood, then you've got Melbourne, you've got... Old motion, we've got different localities. So Medina had different localities, and the locality which was closest coming from the direction of Makkah was Quba. So which direction is Quba gonna be in? From in, in Medina. South. south. south yeah? So in the south of Medina, so Makkah's here, Medina's here, the Prophet's coming up. So here on this corner, so the center of the city is here, but here is Quba. So as soon as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes into uh, Medina, the first place they arrive at is Quba. So the Muslims in Medina, every day they are after Fajr, they would come out. They've heard that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has left Makkah and is on his way. So every day they will be there, looking into the distance. That can we spot the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam coming? And then when the sun would get too hot, then they would go back inside. And then after a few days, some of them were beginning to give up. You know, it's a very harsh environment out there. Maybe the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has passed away. But then eventually, uh, Abdullah bin Salam, he says, oh look, there's some guys coming. Is that your king? So uh, that's a Jewish, a Jewish rabbi, Abdullah bin Salam. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is coming. So what did the people sing when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam came into Medina? Sorry? Medina bin Nabi. I don't, what, what's the one? Who's going to sing it? There's a... No, come on. I thought you... Tala al-Badru alayna min thani'ati al Who knows it? Carry on. So, uh, okay, the truth is, the truth is this didn't happen at the time of Hijrah. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into Medina at the time of Hijrah, everyone thinks it did, but it didn't. Yeah? Everyone, in, in, even in some books, it's written that this was sung by the young girls. That the, you know, the moon is in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has arrived into Medina. But the problem with this is, they say, Min thani adil wada. Where is thani adil wada? It's in the opposite direction. The Prophet is coming in from the south, but Thani Adil Wada is in the north. So it doesn't make sense for them to say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come from Min Thani Adil Wada. So the truth is that this was sung when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was returning from the Battle of Tabuk. From the Battle of Tabuk, they came from the north. And then the people in happiness that the Muslims have been victorious, they are arriving back, they, that's when they sung it. Uh, so it's not quite right to say that the young girls sung this at the time of Hijrah. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he arrives in Quba, and he stays there for a few days. He's waiting for Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. So remember, Ali ibn Abi Talib was left back in Makkah. Why? 
you remember when the soldiers surrounded the house of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then Ali radiallahu anhu was told to stay in the bed. Is actually a risk for Ali radiallahu an? Because imagine if they if they soldiers thought the Quraysh, they thought it's the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They were let's attack the Prophet when he's sleeping. Who would they have attacked? Ali. So Ali is like putting himself radiallahu an in a dangerous position. So one of the reasons was for him to sleep in the bed. And the second reason why he stayed behind in, in Makkah was to return the amana. So obviously in those days, there was no bank, banks or there was no safe storages where you could keep your valuables. So you know your life savings would be with you at home. So if you are traveling or something, your house is going to be empty. It would not be safe to leave your life savings there. So the Arabs had this practice that you would find a trustworthy man, you trusted him, and as you are going, you gave him all your valuables to look after, and when you come back, you will get them back. Majority of the Quraysh, even those who did not believe in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even those who opposed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even they had so much trust that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sadiq, he's amin, he's the most truthful, he's the most trustworthy. That even they would leave their valuables with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi. They didn't believe in him. They didn't think he was a prophet. They actually opposed him in every single way. But when it came to trusting the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they would trust him the most. So hence, loads of people had left their valuables with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And now the Prophet is leaving Mecca and going to Medina. He needs to give those valuables back. So Ali radiallahu anhu was given that job. So he learned an important lesson. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's enemies took him to be the most trust, trustworthy. So imagine, if as Muslims we could become trustworthy people as well, then you know what a great uh, success story it would be. How much progress we could make if we were truthful and we were trustworthy. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "The ayatul munafiki thalatha." There are three signs of a hypocrite. That either when he speaks, he lies. When he makes a promise, he breaks his promise. And when he's given some amana, he breaks that trust. So they knew the Prophet is not going to fiddle their wealth and take some and give the money half back or usurp all the wealth. No. They knew that that, that was not going to happen. They trusted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much. So imagine what lesson we are learning of being truthful, being trustworthy in our lives as well. Just one incident on this. It is the, you know, the time of the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr, the Quraysh have an army of how many? 1,000. The Quraysh, uh, Abu Jahl is taking his army of 1,000 towards Badr. At that time, Huzaifa bin Yaman. So Huzaifa and his father Yaman are migrating from Makkah to Medina. And as they are, you know, it's just a coincidence, it's the time of the Battle of Badr, and they are apprehended by Abu Jahl. So Abu Jahl says, where are you going? So they said, we are going to Medina to join the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Jahl says that if we let you go, you're going to go and join the army of the Muslims. So we are basically enforcing our own enemy. So we're not going to let you go. We're going to keep you captured and ambushed. So Huzaifa and his father Yaman, they said, look, let us go to Medina, but we make a deal with you, we make a promise that we are not going to participate in the Battle of Badr. Remember, the Battle of Badr, how many do Muslims have? 313. And the Quraysh have 1,000. So Muslims are outnumbered, 3 to 1. So they need every single member to join the army they can. But when Huzaifa bin Yaman and his father arrive in Medina, the Prophet is about to leave for Badr as well. So when they say that we were apprehended by Abu Jahl, we made this promise. Although they made a promise to Abu Jahl, the Fir'aun of this Ummah, but even then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa you cannot join us in this battle. Why? Because you've you given your word to someone. So imagine how uh, trustworthy the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and how much trustworthy we have to be as well in fulfilling our amana, fulfilling our promises. You know, when, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam proposed to Aisha to get married, radiallahu anha, then when the proposal came to Abu Bakr, did Abu Bakr want to get married his daughter to the Prophet or not? Yes. yes. He, so he would have jumped at the opportunity and said yes. But he said, no, I can't say yes no, now. Because Aisha radiallahu anh, they were in talks with another family. So Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, he said that let me go and clarify with them. If they're no longer interested 
and they pulled out, then I can give you my daughter. Otherwise, we, have already, have an, we already have an agreement. So Abu Bakr, he went and spoke to the family. They said no. And then she got married to the Prophet. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So imagine how trustworthy he was Even the enemies would leave their possessions with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So in Quba The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam waits for Ali Radiallahu and he arrives Then the daughters of Abu Bakr Asma and Aisha Radiallahu anhu They also arrived And in those few days The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed in Quba He actually built the first masjid ever the first masjid ever formed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam known as Masjid Al-Quba. So those who go for Umrah, you must have seen it. What color is it? It's a, white, it's a very white building. Yeah? So that was the first masjid built. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put down the first foundation, Abu Bakr the second one, Ali the third one, and then everyone joined in. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam physically got himself involved in building the masjid. He would, go, he would get his clothes dusty, he would go and get the rocks and everything, and they engage in building the masjid. So the first lesson that we learned, the Prophet only arrived in Medina. One, two days later, even before building his own house, what is he building? He's building the masjid. So why is that teaching us? That masjid is an integral part of our lives. Even before our houses, when we are moving houses, when we are going to another locality, when we are finding where we are going to stay, the first thing we should be checking, is there a masjid nearby? Is, am, am I going to be able to go and pray my salah? Am I going to be able to send my children to the masjid to learn the Quran? The first thing should be the masjid. And then when we do have a masjid, mashallah, we should try our best to attend as much as we possibly can. The masjid should be an integral part of our lives. Not that we only come on Juma. But every single day, you know, we should make an effort, we should improve. Maybe this year I'm going to come at least once every day. And then make a progress next year. I want to come twice every day. And then eventually work out that I'm coming five, day, five times a day. But we need to have a method. We need to have some ambition that we are going to make the masjid part and parcel of our life. So the first thing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does is build this masjid, Masjid Al-Quba, in this place of Quba. And it's a, it's a blessed masjid. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even afterwards, every Saturday... Every Saturday, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would pray Fajr Salah in the Masjid al Nabawi, and then he would either walk or ride to Masjid al-Quba. And then he would pray a few nawafil in Masjid al-Quba. And in one hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever does wudu at home, then he goes to Masjid al Nabawi, and then he travels to Masjid al-Quba, then he will get the reward of one accepted Umrah. So imagine in those days, Maybe for the people from Medina to go to Makkah was hard. So they said, at least come to Masjid Quba. So those people, you know, when we go to Medina, we should try and act upon this sunnah that on Saturday, we pray Fajr in Masjid Nabawi, and then either walk or take a taxi to Masjid Quba. And we should go, you should not want to go there when another you know, the tour says, oh, we're all going on a sightseeing, and then we go and take pictures of Masjid Quba and come back. Yeah. So we should actually pray inside That was a, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do When he would go to Masjid Al-Quba Masjid Al-Quba has just been referenced in the Quran Whereabouts? Where is the Prophet? Where is the Masjid Al-Quba mentioned in the Quran? In Surah Tawbah Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Says وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا ذِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So what happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was that some of the Munafiqeen, they built another masjid in the vicinity of Quba. You know, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, the leader of the hypocrites, he built another masjid. And Allah speaks about this masjid as Masjid al-Zirar, the masjid of harm. The masjid is supposed to be a place of benefit. Where we come, spiritual, we gain spirituality, we gain piety, we gain taqwa from the masjid. But the, the masjid was masjid and dirar, masjid of harm or kufr. Masjid of kufr and masjid of... So we learned that even masajid, if they have been built with the wrong intention, Allah is saying in the Quran, they are masjids of harm and masjids of kufr. And what the free campaign al mu'minin and a means of dividing people. You know, if you build a masjid, that, that's their masjid, we and they. If you are, Allah is saying... That's Masjid al Ham. So when the Munafiqeen they built the Masjid in the vicinity of uh, Quba, they invited the Prophet that come and pray in our Masjid. 
So the Prophet, uh, then Allah told the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, لا تقوم فيه أبدا. Don't ever enter that masjid. Why? The masjid that you shouldn't. لا مسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه. That masjid, the foundations of which are built upon taqwa, that's the masjid that you should be entering. A masjid built on differences, of, on race, on you know family problems or anything else. The Prophet said, don't even enter that masjid. And then Allah says, لا تكم فيه عبد الله مسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم حق أن تكم فيه رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا Allah says, in there, in Quba, there are people who, who are really, uh, who like to purify themselves. And Allah loves those who purify themselves. So when the people of Quba was asked, that how, why is Allah saying that he, you purify yourself? So how would they, why are they loved by Allah? In which way would they purify themselves extra? So you know when you go to the toilet, obviously in those days water, there wasn't much water. So people would use you know, dry clay lumps to clean themselves after going to the toilet. But the people of Quba, they would use water and clay. So because they would use extra form of cleanliness, Allah says that Allah loves those people who purify themselves. So, in general culture of the Muslims is, when we go to the toilet, we use water and we use, we use uh, paper, to, to, tissue paper as well. So that's what Allah is mentioning, why he loves the people of Quba. So that's where the Masjid of Quba is mentioned in the Quran. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stays in Quba for a few days, and now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is going to come into Medina itself, the center of Medina. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam leaves Kuba, leaves Kuba on Friday morning. And as they traveling, what do they need to do? <coughs> so they left Kuba on Friday morning. So what, what do they need to do on the way? They need to pray Jum'ah. So the first Jum'ah ever led by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, obviously in Makkah, they, they never prayed Jum'ah because they weren't allowed to congregate openly. So the first Jum'ah. He was neither in Quba and he was neither in Medina, Masjid al Nabawi. He was in the way. So the, they have left, and then the Prophet وسلم, stopped to pray the Juma Salah on the journey. And there the Prophet وسلم, gave a khutbah. And does anyone know how long the khutbah was? So there's not many recorded khutbahs of the Prophet. But generally, the khutbahs were very sure of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's about three to five minutes the khutbah. So you know, even the khutbah done in Hajjatul Wada, the final sermon of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is about five paragraphs. Again, five minutes. That's it. So the most important sermon is short as well. So there's actually a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that faqaha, the correct understanding is to have the khutbah short and the salah longer. So hence the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wouldn't, he wouldn't waffle on. One of the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al jawami ul kalim. He will be able to say much with, with less words. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his khutbah was very short. In the first khutbah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam praised Allah. He reminded them about death. He told them that the successful person is that person who follows Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is granted jannah. Another message in the khutbah was taqwa. That remember that you must have taqwa, you must have the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another message in the first ever khutbah was to read the Quran. To make sure you continue reading the Quran and understanding the Quran. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told them about charity. Obviously, now the most, the, you know, the most thing the Muslims need is charity now. So the Prophet is encouraging them about charity and then he, he tells them about brotherhood. So these are some of the points in this very short khutbah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave. So the thing that we need to remember, that the khutbah itself should be our weekly reminder every single Friday. So it shouldn't be that we are running last ones in for Juma, pray our two rakats, maybe get one, miss one rakat as well, and then we are the first ones out. So Juma should be something really important. It's an important day. Like the hadith that we heard at the beginning, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the greatest day is the day of Jum'ah. Allah chose the day of Jum'ah to create Adam alayhi salam. On Jum'ah, Adam alayhi salam was entered into Jannah. On Jum'ah, 
Adam alayhi salam passed away. The trumpet for the day of judgment will be blown on Jumu'ah. And the subsequent rising after the trumpet will be also on Jumu'ah. So these great events, Allah chose the day of Jumu'ah for them. So the Jumu'ah should not be treated as a normal day. In one hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Sayyidul Ayyam, that the leader of all the days is Jumu'ah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more virtuous than the days of Eid. You know, on Eid, everyone comes to pray Eid Salah, isn't it? Everyone treats the day as special. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, the day of Jumu'ah is even more virtuous than the day of Eid. But the issue is, that you know, something that you get often, you don't appreciate it. You know, Eid comes twice a year. So you have to wait 10 months or 2 months before Eid comes. So then, when Eid comes, everyone's excited and because you, you haven't seen it for a long time. But Juma is coming every week. What, what's the difference? You know, it came last week, 7 days later, you got Juma again, Juma again. We don't understand how significant and how important it is. There's a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, إِنَّهُمْ لَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ عَلَىٰ شَيْءٍ كَمَا حَسَدُونَ عَلَىٰ الْجُمْعَةِ The people, they don't, the nations before, they never envied us upon anything else than Jumu'ah. The, the fact that our Ummah, we have this Jumu'ah. Like we said, that from one Jumu'ah to the other Jumu'ah, all the sins are forgiven. Other nations didn't have that. And they would envy us for this opportunity that we have. So whenever the day of Jumu'ah comes, we should make sure that we arrive in the masjid. And we arrive nice and early, like we heard in the hadith. The earlier you, you come, the more reward that, you, that we get. What was the hadith that we heard at the beginning? That the first group that will come will get the reward of sacrificing a camel. The next group who comes get the reward of sacrificing a cow. The next group sacrificing a ram. Yeah, then it gets smaller and smaller. And then those who come after the Imam started talking, they don't get any extra reward. The obligation of Jummah is lifted, but any extra reward is not, and they don't get it. So we should try and aim. You know, most of us, mashallah, are self employed or we start our work later on. So we should make sure we get here for the English talk as well. That should be our spiritual you know, enlightenment every single week. It shouldn't just be that we are coming lastminute.com. So we should give importance to that. If, before we take any job on, you know, when we are offered a job, the first thing that should be discussed is that will I be able to attend Juma? Will I be able to get maybe an extended lunch break? And is there a, a Juma close by where I can go and pray my Juma? If you can't do that, then maybe you, you, know, you should reconsider taking that job on or not. As a believer, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has warned us, anyone who misses three Jummahs in a row, then his heart will be sealed. So Jummah is extremely important. We have to give seriousness to that matter and we cannot just let Jummah go like that. And then on Jummah, we have many practices. Come on, quickly tell me. We're running out of time, but tell me some practices that we should do on Jummah. Sorry? We should, we should have a shower, we should wear our best clothes, we should recite Surah Kahf, that will save us from Dajjal. Sorry? We should wear, the Prophet loved to wear white. Uh, we should put perfume on. So we all put deodorant uh, anyway, or if you don't, I hope you do. You should put deodorant on anyway. But you make the intention that it's a sunnah to put, uh, put, uh, put perfume on, then we will get reward for it. It's actually a sunnah to come early on the day of Jumu'ah. To wake up early as well. So we should do that. We should send more durood upon the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And importantly, listen to the khutbah attentively. Just finish off with one hadith. There's a, there's a hadith. It's not a hadith. One companion mentioned. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He mentioned that I came to the masjid with one person. And he came to the masjid for Jumu'ah. And he was like the third or the fourth person there. So the one companion, he says to the other one. We are the fourth, fifth people to arrive, I think. That's good enough. So he's like, what, what, what do you mean? Then he says that I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that you know on the day of Qiyamah, even on the day of Qiyamah, Jumu'ah will be a special day. What will happen on the day of Jumu'ah? Duty Bazaar. Beauty Bazaar. And the greatest thing will be? Singh. Allah will come. On Jum'ah, Allah will come and present Himself. In front. All the wails will be removed in front of Allah and people will be able to see Allah. So you know, when we'll be seeing Allah, then you know, you, some, you, sometimes you get the front seats and then you got the back seats. And then you, you know, you've got rows. 
Some people get the better seat, some get, how is that going to be decided? So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu says, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that that rows will be made according to the way people would come in Jumu'ah. So those who would come early for Jumu'ah, they would get the front seats on the day of Qiyamah when you come, when you get to see Allah. And those who will be lastminute.com, they will get the back rows there as well. So again, Jumu'ah, important. There's many other su- sunan of Jumu'ah, Jumu'ah as well. We should search it up. We should treat Jumu'ah as special and really make sure that we never miss a single Jumu'ah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to understand the significance of the masjid and significance of having good character and having been trustworthy and sadiq and ameen and also understand the significance of the day of Jumu'ah wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in We're running a bit late today so we better hurry up with the snacks inshallah I think the adhan time has already started